Welcome to the Borderless Podcast, your guide to traveling, investing, and living beyond borders, where we talk about living the life that you want to live where you want to live it. What is up, everybody? Welcome to another Borderless Podcast. This is your host, James Guzman. Today, I'm speaking to Derek Bros from The Conscious Resistance. He came down to San Miguel uh, a couple of months, a few months ago, and uh, we launched the San Miguel de Allende Freedom Cell, so I'm helping him with that, that uh, I interviewed John Bush about. You can go back, I think about five episodes, and we talked about their what they're doing with Freedom Cells. And uh, we also just talked about what he's doing here in Mexico. He's helping people move down here, how he's found life here, things like that. So if you're interested in that, I think you're going to enjoy this podcast. Before we get started, I want to remind everybody that if you are coming to Mexico or moving internationally, go to borderlesshealthinsurance.com. If you uh, are looking for coverage to go to the private hospitals in Mexico or throughout the world, um, I can help you with that. You set up a cons- free consultation. You get to see what um, your options might be for that. Also want to remind everybody that uh, December, it's less than a month now, we are going to uh, Sayulita and we're going to have an event down there with uh, many cool people. So I'll put the links in the link in the show notes. It's called the Sayulita Super Spreader. <laughs> so I'm sure people really love that name. But um, if that interests you, then come down. It's going to be a lot of good speakers, uh, some comedy shows. It's going to be a lot of fun. And Sayulita is a beautiful beach town that's completely free and open. So really looking forward to that. And uh, at the end of the podcast, we'll talk about Derek's, uh, he's going to do a webinar, Mexit. Uh, and um, so if you are interested in more of the information about what he's offering, then uh, do listen to the whole episode and uh, check out what he's doing, which is in less than a week, uh, they're going to have a webinar. So I hope you enjoy the podcast. Borderless. Okay, Derek, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing great, brother. Thanks for having me on. All right. Yeah, sounds good. So you are back down here in Mexico. How was how was that? Well, I'm happy to be in Mexico. I'm in Morelia, for those who are unaware, in Michoacan, uh, a couple hours south of you. And uh, we, yeah, we spent a couple months in the U.S. It was great to be out there to connect and meet mm-hmm. people. But I definitely can say nothing feels quite like coming back to Mexico. Uh, it's it's interesting for I've only been living here now for the last year and a half, but visiting for the last six years. And it's crazy how this place already feels more like home for sure. Wow. Yeah, I know. I'd, you know, there's, it's hard to put your finger on everything that's great about it, but you know, I've been in Mexico for over 10 years now and uh, you know, it's definitely San Miguel is my home here. And I, yeah, it's just something that feels uh, just friendly and I don't know, you know, a lot freer and stuff like that. Even when I've gone back to the States or whatever, I just, I really am happy when I get back. So I know the feeling. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's, it was interesting. I'll, I'll just say one, one thing real quick about the States is I think a lot of people we know, maybe people who follow our work, even who um, have been to Mexico or been considering Mexico. And for one reason or another, maybe found their way back to the States. I met a lot of folks like that who are like, Oh, I was there last year. I'm mm-hmm. coming back now, or I'm figuring things out. I just want to say to any of those people who happen to hear this conversation, I would definitely encourage you not to get comfortable in the U.S. and think that things are chill and sort of give up on the idea of Mexico because there's lots of benefits being out here for sure. Just want to throw that out there. Yeah. You know, what my normal recommendation is, is because I understand a lot of people are, you know, they're hesitant and, you know, they they really make this, they make it a big deal about moving somewhere because maybe they've been somewhere their whole life. And I get that. But what I, you know, try to recommend people is to get, you know, have a second option, at least have a place, you have a residency or have a way to get there, know some people in another place. So that you just, at least you have another option in case you need to bail out or something like that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So how was that? Let me know about the um, the whole situation. I know you're coming across the border, you know, you've been doing that lately and oh, people yeah. always have questions about what's really going on. So how's that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We so we just crossed uh, today. We're recording this on a Friday. We crossed on Wednesday, and I mean, there's so much. As you know, I'm sure you probably get the questions in the the comments online. Oh, yeah. There's so much, so much rumors constantly about what's going on in Mexico or what's about to happen or mm-hmm. what situation has changed. And honestly, things are in flux because of COVID. So I I kind of get people's like, oh my god, what, what's happening? But uh, we've been traveling back and forth to Mexico since March 20, 2020. Myself and my partner, we just decided like we're getting heck out of the U.S. when they started doing all the COVID stuff. And we figured, well, we've been planning to move to Mexico. She's got family in Mexico. Let's just go ahead and do it. 
And uh, that was right around the time the U.S. government was announcing that the borders were closing. And so they still, up until just a couple of weeks ago, claim that the borders have been closed. Um, and now that they are rolling out the, the shots, they've said, OK, well, now Mexicans and Canadians who've gotten the shots, they can come back to the U.S. And it's really it's so weird, man, the propaganda. Just this week, I was watching on CNN a couple of days ago when this measure went into effect on Monday and they they showed pictures from the airports and showing families are reunited finally after the borders opening. It's like it's never been closed in the first place, but it's also kind of propaganda. Like, look at these people who've got the shot. Now they're being reunited mm-hmm. with their families. But yeah, so there's always a lot of confusion. But I will say this again, it's never been closed for American citizens. I have heard things about Mexicans and Canadians being denied over the last year and a half. Like I said, now you have to have got the shot to come. But for Americans coming back and forth, we've had no issue. We crossed, um, we do these caravans for the last year and a half, and I call it Operation Underground Railroad. And right now it's pretty much just a, a free service. Like it's nothing illegal about what we're doing. We're just helping people who choose to meet us at the border. Some people meet us in Houston where we leave from or just meet us at the border crossing in Laredo. And uh, we just help them go across for people who've never done it. And maybe they don't have that great of Spanish or whatever help them uh, do the paperwork and then they can either follow us to Morelia or they can just kind of go on their own way if that's all they need. Uh, Most of the time the people follow us to Morelia to kind of get their, you know, their feet on the ground and then figure out what's next for them. And so that's what we just did. We actually had a six car caravan. It was pretty cool. We had six cars of people coming down here and some of them are here in Morelia. We're going to be having a community potluck tomorrow. We try to have, you know, things going on in the city and some of them will go on to other places and figure out what's next for them. But that's something we've been doing. And so because of that, we've really kept up with what's happening to the border. And we've made a dozen plus trips back and forth over the last year, um, just sometimes just to do these trips, sometimes to see our families and whatever. Uh, but yeah, we came recently, literally no questions at all about COVID. The last four times that we've crossed, we haven't even spoke to a single human being. I mean, other than when you go in to do the permit, this is it's just Mexico, I think. Right. Some people like Mexico, the, the times that we've crossed, there's been times where they've searched the car sort of lightly. There's times where they just say, go on. But the last three or four times, literally, when we're crossing the International Bridge and coming into the Mexican side, you see the employees standing off to the right, having their own conversation. And if you just stay in the left lane and just stay to the left Nobody even looks at you, goes in your direction. So we had six cars drive right through there, not talk to a single officer, leave that check area and go into the building, do our permit work. And then from there, when you leave, you usually drive about 20 miles when you're headed to Monterey and you, there's like one more checkpoint when they check your, your car paperwork to make sure you're legit. There wasn't even a single person there. That's happened the last four times we've crossed, like not a single person talking to us crossing the border, not a single person checking paperwork. Make of that information what you will, um, but Mm -hmm. it's been very, very chill. And that's Laredo in Texas. Yeah, uh, I've had the same experience there a lot, actually. I went, I did that, well, about a month ago or so. And it was the same thing, but I usually walk across. Um, But uh, yeah, and um, you know what was funny, what I was going to mention? Well, uh, let me say something real quick, because also I think that there has been some uh, change in uh, the Mexican immigration. It seems that um, they are being a little bit stricter with giving the tourist visas. So I've heard firsthand from people that have come recently and they've only been given, say, a 10 or 20 day visa rather than just an automatic six month. So, yeah, we have heard that as well. All six of us or seven of us that were on this trip all got the, for the people who are doing the visas. Everybody got full 180 days. But okay. you're right. I have heard some chatter about that um, through the Telegram groups and online and whatnot. Um, I, that wasn't our experience a couple of days ago, at least in the Rado. Okay. Uh, we didn't really have any. That, you know, there wasn't really any issues for our, our case. But yeah, that is what I've heard in some parts of the country. And I don't know if that's just depends on what country you're coming from or where you're entering the country. You know, there's a lot of variables. You know, what's what's kind of funny. Um, do you know who Gary Gibson is? I don't think so. OK, he used to run a blog a long time ago uh, called um, Guns, Butter and Bullets or something like that. And OK, I think I've heard started- that. Yeah. And then he started working for TDV when I did 10 years ago. So the, the, you know, these TDV groups, I set those up and it's kind of similar to the freedom cell stuff. And we even called it when we would write about it, the underground railroad. 
<laughs> nice. nice. <laughs> 10 years ago. But now, you know, you guys are doing the same thing, but you know, or, you know, we're doing the same thing because I help you here in, in San Miguel. Um, but now, you know, COVID has really kicked people in the ass, you know, but this is something that we've been thinking for a long time that there's going to be a lot of people, you know, we were thinking more of kind of economic degradation, which we're also seeing and that, you know, things would, because of inflation and other types of things, and it would just be so unlivable, like you're seeing in a lot of places that people would just, you know, look for more freedom, in, you know, south of the border. And so we're actually seeing it now. So, yeah, I, that's awesome to hear that you guys were already on that same train of thought. You know, clearly yeah. what we're doing now isn't anything necessarily new. It's just we're just trying to offer that help because we can. For me, the idea came from uh, my my last book I published literally two weeks before they announced COVID. I published it January 30, uh, 30th, 2020, and it's called How to Opt Out of the Technocratic State. And it just deals with everything we're facing now. And in the book I wrote, it like I was kind of imagining five, 10 years down the line, maybe, right? I didn't know it was about to become necessary. But I was like, hey, at some point, things are going to get bad enough where people are going to need help getting in and out of free, you know, less free places to places that are more free in different ways. And I believe the United States is one of those. And I was talking about the historic Underground Railroad from the Civil War. And most people know the civil, the uh, Underground Railroad in terms of taking people to Canada. But a lot of people don't realize they actually did help people escape to Mexico as well, because Mexico ended slavery before the U.S., and, um, you know, so there was slaves that were escaping north, but there were also slaves who were using safe houses and properties and, you know, the different people helping them along the, the railroad to go south. And so to me, it's kind of like that's just a continuation of what happened in the past. Yeah. So there might be people that are listening, you know, and they're thinking like, you know, oh, just because of COVID, I want to drop everything and go to Mexico. Maybe they don't have the larger view of what is actually going on so if you could boil it down and you know in your view what you know obviously it's not just about covid right so there what is what is going on and why to you why is going to mexico like good in your eyes you know for you so i mean i think probably i would assume most of your listeners or anybody who's going to stumble across this has at the least heard of terms like the great reset by this point you know and if you're not familiar with that term maybe you're familiar with the previous you know term the new world order for for lack of a better term i mean essentially what we're seeing like you said it's COVID. is this situation is not about COVID. that's definitely something hopefully everybody has come to terms with and realize okay this isn't just about some sickness or some illness there's a bigger agenda here and as I was writing in that book, How to Opt Out of the Technocratic State, which, by the way, you can download for free at theconsciousresistance.com slash how to. Um, as I was writing in that book, these agendas have been going on for a while. And essentially, it's a technocracy, which is a, a rule by experts, scientific elite, which is what we're seeing really kind of implemented right now, again, under the guise of fighting COVID. Uh, you know, obviously, we know about democracy, demo people, rule by people, what, whatever issues we have with the system, that's what it's supposed to be. Then you have monarchy, you know, rule by one person, dictatorship, etc. The technocracy and the people who support this idea in the mid 1800s, when they were first starting to pr promote it, and in the early 1900s, they were basically saying, look, the systems we have aren't working you know, socialism isn't the answer. People were just starting to push for socialism. They were like, no, what we need is instead to get the smartest people, the scientists and all the technological experts and put them in positions of power. Interesting kind of side note, um, Elon Musk's grandfather was a part of the, the founder of the Social Credit Party in Canada that was really pushing this idea up there, among others, you know, and here we are fast forward today and the technocrats of the world today are the Bill Gates, the Bezos, the Zuckerbergs and others who are unelected from power, you know, whether we trust those systems or not, there's not even the pretend of like, oh, we elected them, let's let them make decisions. But they have a lot of money and they have more than money, they have influence and connections and networks that they've established over time. So someone like Bill Gates can not be elected to anybody's government at all, but then can fund projects to geoengineer the skies, for one example, to buy up all the farmland in the United States. You know, they have immense power through just it's not just about the money. I think some people obsessed, like, you know, particularly the left, they're like, oh, just tax the billionaires or whatever. It's like, it's not just their money. Like, at this point, it's they have so much control and influence by infecting the media and all these different institutions. So COVID is just allowing people who've had these plans before, going back to the Rockefellers and others who are working on essentially trying to control and tra track all human life. You know, the technocracy, this technocratic world is the smart cities of the future, 
Right now, we're shifting from the COVID narrative back to the kind of climate change narrative where they're talking about carbon credit allowances and social, you know, these ideas, these are the kind of big picture ideas that we're all going to see. The uh, climate agenda is important because the United Nations announced what they call sustainable development goals, 17 of them, and their goal was to achieve them by 2030. This is what's known as Agenda 2030 or the 2030 Agenda. And so here we are in 2021 going on 2022, and we can see all the plans that they would like to see being kind of pushed forward under the name of fighting COVID or now fighting the climate. It's like, hey, well, we locked down the whole world and it was better for the planet. You know, why don't, maybe we should do climate lockdowns periodically, right? Now they're talking about those ideas. So, yeah, it's all a bigger agenda. Um, in regards to why Mexico, you know, because, of course, somebody will say, well, why are you going to Mexico? This is a this is a global and international worldwide agenda, right? They're going to come everywhere. And I agree. It absolutely is. There's no place that's necessarily always going to be safe. But there are some places I think we can look and say, hey, there's more freedom in this place than there is at this other place. And I also notice there's a lot of like American, <laughs> I don't know patriotism is the right word or whatever people i don't know if you've seen this people get so triggered by the idea that you would want to leave the u.s and go to mexico mm-hmm. i've noticed that a lot but a few reasons just kind of off the hat and is just for one mexico is behind when it comes to technology in the sense of not to say like you don't have internet obviously we're both in mexico broadcasting on the internet now but you don't have other than in say mexico city and some of the major cities you don't have what people like myself who are from Houston are used to facial recognition cameras everywhere, cameras on every corner of downtown, 24 hour station manned by the police and the department of Homeland security, um, phone tracking technology, just all these different things that come along with the the big cities. You don't have that in most of Mexico and the infrastructure that they're trying to build in the United States and Western Europe and Australia and elsewhere for the smart city technology, 5g, 6g, um, autonomous vehicles, all these different ways that they want to have the Internet of Things, the Internet of Bodies, uh, the Internet of Senses, they they even talked about, where everything will be a part of this larger infrastructure, what what now we're hearing called the metaverse. Um, All of that is part of the Agenda 2030, and that's already rolling out in the U.S., Places like like Houston have already got those things in motion, like they're already, that's already happening. There definitely is an effort to make that happen in Mexico, and we can talk about some of the scarier aspects of bills that are trying to be put forward. But for the moment, it's it's just it's at least I would say a decade behind the U.S. and elsewhere, if not more. You know, because it takes some time to get this infrastructure in there. I do think there's some concerns that if people like us and other you know Mexican activists don't start building that consciousness about why we need to be skeptical or at least critical about some forms of technology, then Mexico, like most of Europe and the U.S. will just walk blindly into the the world we see now. You know, I think people will just get consumed by all of it. And then, oh, crap, we just gave up all our privacy. Right. So I I do see that there are so many benefits to being here in Mexico. And, you know, I plan to share more of those in this webinar. But I, I also hear the concerns that people have. And ultimately, for me, this isn't about running. I love Mexico. I want to be here. This is where I'm going to, you know, fight my fight. I also, you know, I love the U.S. and my family there. And if I have to support them how I can, I'm going to try. But I feel like this is where I want to be with this is all going on, you know. So if, if pe- there are people who I see, they're running from Europe or the U.S. or Canada and they're coming to Mexico and they're like, oh, but I heard about this one bad thing. Looks like I need right. to look somewhere else. It's like at some point you got to stop you gotta running. Stop. Like, yeah. You, you got to pick somewhere that you're going to, you know, build. I agree. Yeah, I have. I mean, I don't think I've talked about this on the podcast, but, you know, I did a lot of kind of um, digital nomad stuff and I had a, a discussion with a guy four years ago, you know, we were talking about the difference between an expat and a digital nomad. I would say that at this point, I'm like, you know, fully expat. I mean, I'm living here. I'm not going jumping around. I'm not doing any of that stuff anymore. So this is uh, what I'm doing now. You know, I'm I'm married. I got a, a house here, dog and stuff. So I'm not doing the, uh, the young uh, single guy jumping around the world type thing anymore. But it's, you know, it's good. I, there are people that still do that, even with all the rules and they're able to do that. And that's fine. But I just, you know, it was hard enough. I hated the TSA, you know, after 9-11. And, um, you know, that was bad enough. And then with all these different restrictions, I just don't want to deal with these bureaucrats. It was crap. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I, I'm with you. Unfortunately, though, the problem is, is that that's exactly what they want you to do. They want people to stay in their areas so they can be easier yeah. to control. They don't want us to have, you know, they want to be flying around and, you know, doing all this stuff. 
but I don't know. Anyways, it's just, we got to deal with it however we, we best can. And, yeah, absolutely. you know, about the um, technocracy thing, I mean, you know, it's like whatever this, uh, this, the new world order thing that's, you know, that's uh, the great reset that's obviously coming into view now, you know, a lot of people, they just think maybe they aren't fully awake. You know, they think, well, I could just play along and whatever you just, just get the, you know, get the shot or just get the passport and use the CBDCs or whatever. And, you know, you just got to do it, but I just want to, you know, let people know when you really look into it. um, One of the core things is that, uh, you know, is Malthusianism, you know, that there's too many people on the planet, especially with all this technology, technology being rolled out is eugenics. And so you got to get in your head that basically they want to kill you. (laughs) So you Absolutely. can't just go along with somebody who wants to kill you. All right. That's the bottom line. It's that easy. You yeah. Know? I'm glad you brought up that point. Cause I mean, just to add to that, that is like, you know, if we're going to go all in, let's go all in. That's where it's at. Like, that's what this is really about. Like you said, it's a Malthusian anti-human agenda. Like it very much is. So it's, it's, and people are already finding that out. You know, we met people on the tour who are already losing their jobs because of the COVID mandates and whatnot. And there are some people who are like, yeah, man, I'm with you, but I don't know what to do right now. So I went ahead and got the shot for this one moment. And, you know, I'm like, hey, I'm not going to judge you on what you choose to do with your body, your path, whatever. But just be aware, they're now saying in six months, you're not going to be considered vaccinated anyway. So even if you thought you were going to play the game for a little bit, I get some people are like, I don't have an exit now. I don't know what to do. I don't know what my next move is. So I'm just going to stay here while I figure that out. Now's the time to figure that out. Whatever your next move, whether it's Mexico, getting out of the city in the U.S. or somewhere else, like figure out how you're going to continue to feed your family, how you're going to continue to provide for yourself, how you're going to continue to move about if they say you can't do so without the shot or without a test. And that's what's happening. That's what's happening in the U.S. and Costa Rica and Canada and Australia and across Europe. These are the times to really figure out, like you said, James, you're like, okay, I'm set here. I got my family doing my thing. People need to think in those terms because I, I still want to travel and see the world, but I'm also coming to accept that, that I might not be able to do that for a while until we get this thing figured out because I don't want to not only deal with the TSA, but I don't want to wear a mask. I don't want to have to be right. harassed. Exactly. about you know I just don't want to do the whole thing anymore. So, But you're right. They also would like us all to say, fine, I'll just stop flying. It's too much of a hassle. We got to figure out some solution. And for now, it seems like to me that the best strategy is to make sure you're somewhere where you've got some land or something that you can hold and call your own and, you know, and your family and the people you love and, and go from there. That's, you know, cause we're not going to be able to convince everybody we care about to take action. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, it's always very important. You know, a lot of people look at, you know, all these different variables with where they're, where they want to live or where they want to, you know, a, a second uh, residence or something like that. But I would say, you know, one thing a lot of people forget is the network, you know, I mean, you're going to need or you should look for a place where, you know, people, you know, uh, it's very hard just to pick up and and start from scratch by yourself. So that's going to that's another really important thing. You know, like you said, you know, family, friends and and just getting to know people that, um, you know, who knows what could happen in the future that at least you have you can uh, rely on each other. That's what the Freedom Cell thing is about, right? Yeah, exactly. That's why, yeah. you know, Freedom Cells is there. And it, it was cool, man. I'll, I'll say this, and I'm hoping that we're going to get to do a similar activation tour in parts of Mexico coming in the uh, February or March of 2022. Uh, but just we did 29 cities across the U.S. And we met people who are, you know, we've got the website and we got the Telegram cells. And at this point, there's literally tens and thousands of them around the world. I have no idea how the full number we don't admin on all of them is just people creating them organically. It's beautiful to see. And at the same time, I can't sit here and say that every single cell is just as organized as other cells, right? Some people are just getting things going. Some people, well, a lot of people, I think, run into the same problems. They're like, hey, I'm connecting with people. But it seems like some people just want to debate viruses or they just want to talk about politics or they're not ready to do anything yet, right? And so people are really out there trying to find those like-minded action-oriented people, not the people who just want to socialize, you know, that's one part of it. Like you said, having community, having connections, but people are really in a point where they're like, I need to figure out my food security. I need to figure out, you know, crypto or silver, whatever it is. I need to figure out how I'm going to get out of the bank. And so thankfully the people who are being proactive are having success. I met folks in uh, 
Philly and California, all the way up to Seattle and Florida, people who have met folks through the Freedom Cell Network, either the website or the Telegram cells, who are pulling their kids out of school together, pulling their money out of the banks together, buying land together, growing food together. Like it, it was really cool to see. Even just as simple as we were in Salt Lake and like the whole group that was there that were that actually knew each other, they said basically that last year they were all dealing with COVID. And they watched The Greater Reset and connected to the Freedom Cell Network. And they realized, holy crap, we're all near each other. And now they started a group and they're meeting. And, you know, a lot of them were saying, like, this helped me realize I wasn't alone last year. You know, and that itself is a very powerful thing. And then now they're building that community and trying to decide what's next for them. But, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's cool to see that finally happening. And I think it's just that people feel threatened and humans were silly like that. We don't necessarily act whenever we feel comfortable. We act when we feel threatened. And so yep. people are starting to feel under threat. And so they're choosing to focus on solutions right now, which to me is a great thing. This is like what I've been wanting for years and trying to do in my own life. So it's cooler to see now that people are wanting to come to Mexico. People want to hear, but we're getting responses to the webinar from people around the world who are like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to try to see if I can get to Mexico and I'd love to connect to some of the resources you have. Right. So it's good to see that, people are thinking, um, you know, realistically about what's coming and how we're going to thrive through it. Yeah, I definitely, people are feeling panicked. I mean, I, my business, as far as helping people uh, move or, you know, internationally uh, setting them up with, help, you know, insurance, real estate, whatever, all these things um, it's the, been booming more than ever. I mean, I have people contact me and yeah, they seem panicked like they, especially last month with the, uh, in Canada, people that were trying to get the hell out of Canada. A lot of people came down here. So yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely happening like that. And and what's funny is that right now other people are panicked, but really I'm, I feel the opposite. Like I feel like I'm getting too comfortable because down here it's pretty much back to normal. I mean, nothing's really going on. I got my, my friends and family here. We meet together. There's no restrictions on anything. I mean, the only thing is you see people wearing masks, which is kind of like, you know, walking outside with a mask on is like depressing, but <laughs> But yeah, I want to ask you a question real quick, yeah. man. I just, sorry to interject, but we actually yeah. heard from a, a random friend. I don't know how credible the source was, but they were claiming this was maybe a week or two ago that uh, there was talk of some sort of proof of vaccination in San Miguel. I don't know if that was a, like individual businesses or the government. Have you heard anything like that? I mean, like I said, all, know, I hear all kinds I, somebody of Somebody else, rumors. somebody else told me, somebody else told me that somebody told him that. I don't know who was saying that because no, there's never been anybody that's asked me anything about a vaccine anywhere here and nobody has proposed it i don't know where that's coming from uh, okay the only Good thing i mean honestly everything is full capacity restaurants everything is open um i mean the centro is packed on the weekends maybe 10 to 20 percent of people wearing masks uh, in centro well you know when there's a lot of tourists in town and stuff and yeah they have big shows and all kinds of things i mean so no that i have not seen or i don't know what who's saying that or what that's about but no um i just heard today that they're in the um i think it was uh it might have been Guanajuato, one of the uh the universities they had, they had an event and they said they were going to be checking for uh for vax cars or whatever at some event with the through the university um, unfortunately, you know, the university of Guadalajara has been like, it's been the worst, man. They're like really pushing. And that guy, the, the governor there, Alfaro is like the worst in the country. I mean, I don't know what his problem is, but he's, you know, cause he's like anti AMLO. And so here it's like the opposite. So like the conservatives are the ones pushing all the COVID stuff. So he's been the one that trying to push all this stuff. I mean, you know, Luckily, that hasn't been going through, especially on a national level. That's not going to happen right now, you know. But uh, but anyways, that, that's been, they've been really bad. They just um, the University of Guadalajara put together a um, a uh, digital currency, social credit digital currency, where you if you go out and wow. yeah, did you hear about this? No, I haven't. I need to look yeah. that up and check it out. Yeah, wow. yeah. Um, I forget what it's called, but anyways that. Yeah. And they're launching it. Um, and so basically like you can go and if you do good things, then they give you money and it, it expires wow. and you can only spend it in certain places. <laughs> and he's also <laughs> pushing all this, you know, Guadalajara is like the front for smart cities. Yeah. So um, 
I have a friend, uh, Hervoye, who runs the uh, Geopolitics and Empire podcast, which people should check out. And uh, he's always updating me on that because, you know, he's from there. He lives there and he's like all panicking. They're talking about they have suggested vax passports in Guadalajara. Wow. Coming yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it came there just because, like you said, it seems to be kind of a one of the centers for stuff like that. Yeah. So mentioning that. So now you've been around Mexico for a while and, you know, uh, people are probably, you know, a lot of people, maybe they've never even been or just they've been to the beach or something like that. Out of the places that you've been that has a good, you know, say like a large freedom cell or, that, you know, if people are considering it, maybe they don't want to go. What are some positives and negatives from the different cities that they can go to? Yeah, you know, so that's definitely a question I get, and I'm sure you get it often too. Like, what's the best place for in Mexico? And and I mean, clearly that depends on the individual, right? Some people like the beach. I'm over humidity. I lived in Houston, had humidity my whole life. I don't want to be anywhere where it's hot and sweaty. Um, so I like Morelia for the weather up here in the mountains. You can, you know, you're, the city's about 500,000 people, which is much bigger than San Miguel. But for me, it's small because I'm used to 4 million people in Houston. Um, and you, But you have the hills and the mountains nearby, lots of water, uh, street, like fresh springs and waterfalls and things around the state. Uh, I also, there's a good amount of people kind of community in different forms, both like activist wise and just like kind of, I would guess you would say, um, some freedom cell community in San Cristobal, Chiapas. There's, you know, that generally that area attracts like, it, it's an interesting mix to me of like expats, Mexicans on vacation and indigenous people from that area, right? That kind of all show up there. And it's definitely low in the um, mask kind of vaccine compliance. Just Chiapas in general has had, you know, dozens and dozens of municipalities rejecting the vaccines over there. So that's one thing that I think excites some people and some of those kind of smaller indigenous communities. I don't know if those would be ideal for people to just go move into, you know, maybe it's not necessarily what they're looking for, but I do think there is some benefits to being uh, in proximity to different indigenous communities around the country. I mentioned Morelia where we're at here, you know, Chiran is about two hours away from us where they have celebrated their 10 year anniversary of kicking out the cartels and the cops and everything. So you know, there's those, those options. Um, and then people who do like the beach, like obviously, I'm sure people on this podcast are familiar with Acapulco. I have my reasons for not really being that excited about Acapulco. I think there's people there. I haven't seen any kind of, not to say it isn't there because, you know, I'm not there full time, but I haven't seen really a coalescing community coming together. I've seen a lot of people moving out there under the impression that there's community for various reasons. You know, maybe they hear people talking about it on various podcasts out there that Acapulco is the place to be. And they show up and there's no community. There's not really anything going on. There's people out there kind of doing their things. But uh, it's also known in somewhat in the community as drama poco because of just <laughs> the drama out there. Uh, but I feel like a beach that is smaller and I think more chill. Zihuatanejo is a beautiful area as far as like small fishing town that does have tourists. And you'll see Americans there, but not overwhelmingly. You're still in Mexico. You know, a lot of places, like you said, maybe some people have only been to the beach. If you go just to the beaches or Cancun or, you know, just like the resorts in Acapulco or something, you're not really in Mexico per se. You know what I mean, you're kind of in a bubble and it's important to get out of that. I like that Ziwa has that. You can be up by the beaches and see the locals fishing, see some of the tourists, and then you can go a few blocks away and you're in, you know, you're in the neighborhood and in the, in the real Mexico there. So that's one area that I've, I've loved for years, just going and visiting. Um and then I haven't really been to Puerto Vallarta yet, like that area generally, but I do know there's a number of freedom cells groups organizing there as well as uh, Puerto Escondido. And I'm trying to think of all the ones like there's for those who are on Telegram, there's the Mexico freedom cell that you can join. And if you look in the pinned message there, it has a link to like the groups that have formed in Tulum, San Cristobal, um, all the different. Oh, there's a, a really like seems like a popular group growing uh, in Tepoztlan uh, near me South Mexico City that we're going to be going to in a couple of weeks. They're going to actually they reached out to me, the Freedom's out there, and they're translating one of my documentaries into Spanish. And we're going to go out there and do a like a documentary screening for their community. So that seems pretty cool. And they, what I've been told, I haven't been yet. I'm going to go in a couple of weeks. But from what I've been told, that there's a number of like. Um, teacher permaculture teachers out there there's apparently it's like there's a good amount of uh international filmmakers like independent filmmakers that 
for whatever reason have gravitated there. And um, yeah, so I hear good positive things there. I hope to find out in the coming weeks, but I do think there's just depending on what you're looking for. And I haven't even been over to Baja like at all. I don't know, you know, what, what do you know about that area? But I just think Mexico is a big country, right? I mean, there's a lot to offer depending on where you want to go, how close to the U S border you want to be, or how far away you want to be from it. Uh, if you want to be close to the water, if you want to be up in the mountains, you want to be in the city. I think there's a lot of potential depending on people's needs. Yeah. I wanted to clear something up. I was just thinking about it because people are going to call me out. Uh, I said 10 to 20% per, uh, people like wearing masks. I was talking about in central on the weekends when there's lots of tourists, because people come down here and they're going to be like, that's not true. Yeah, it's true. It's like a lot of times if you walk around, like just, you know, the normal during the day, especially the closer you get to in town or by big store, you know, big box stores, then it's, mm-hmm. it's higher higher percentage but i was staying on the yeah. weekends and you know, all the tourists come in and everybody's just like whatever so i just wanted to clear that up people aren't like say i'm a liar um <laughs> uh yeah so i was going to add with some of that stuff with some of my knowledge yeah, it's funny that you said drama poco you know i lived there for two years and man i like have ne- it's ne- it was like the craziest two years of my life probably just it attracts strange people man and and it's just a really strange place i mean i don't know for me in my mid-20s it was fine. I mean, I, you know, I had, I kind of liked that, all the excitement or whatever, but if somebody just wants like chill life, I really would not recommend Acapulco. It's like the opposite of San Miguel where I am now. That's where I came here. It's like everything is the opposite. Um, and uh, another place you mentioned Puerto Vallarta, a lot of people are going there. Puerto Vallarta is cool. It's pretty lax on the COVID stuff. And um so I love our favorite place to go to the beach is Sayulita, which is uh, 45 minutes away from there. And there they have never had any COVID restrictions at all, like zero masks, nice. uh, no nothing. And it's it's a small beach, um, like a um, surfing uh, village type thing, you know, surfing, uh, fishing. And uh, it's really nice. So that's a that's a cool place. And of course, you know, I like this in the center. You have San Miguel de Allende, Caretaro, Guanajuato area. And so. Yeah. Great. So, um, so tell us about the, the activation tour, maybe get a a little more, uh, details about that. If people might want to, to go to one of your, one of your events. Yeah, sure. So, uh, as I said, we did this in the United States and the plan now is basically to, uh, do it again in Mexico. Um, probably again in the U S if, if, if we're able to, uh, probably, I think we're aiming for February and maybe into March, but Basically, every city that we visited is myself and uh, Miriam, my partner, and sometimes we had some other activists and friends with us. But essentially, every city we were visiting, we were coming to town. Like, let's say we arrive on in the afternoon, we do what we call a community action day. And this kind of varied every city. Some places we did like park cleanups. We went out and fed the houseless. We did community garden workshops. Um, sometimes the, the the community action day was just a showcase of all the local activists and local groups and their projects. But the goal of doing that is for one, for me to sh- show people that we have to lead by example that, you know, I don't believe in government or anybody taking care of us. So I think the best way to show people that we can actually live that way is to just do things that show people, hey, like we can take a lead, we can go out and take care of our neighbor, go up and clean up our local area, or, you know, go learn some skills. Like, is that going to bring down the state today? No, but it's definitely going to empower the people involved and help them kind of build a community through those experiences. So we do that like every city. And then in the evening, we kind of have the main event, which uh, is the uh, talk from my partner, Miriam, and she does a talk about spiritual and mental health and then does a 15 minute guided meditation to kind of set the stage for the evening. And then we had traveled with my buddy, Ramiro Romani, who probably will be traveling with us in Mexico. Um, his project is called Take Back Our Tech, takebackourtech.org. So he's very much, much on the tech side of things. He helped us uh, build out some of the Freedom Cell stuff and the Greater Reset uh, project. And you know, he's just more on the tech t- side of things, doing software development, as well as now launching privacy phones and helping people get off Microsoft and Google and onto Linux and things of that sort. And so he was traveling with us and giving a talk about those topics and why it's important to have that aspect of what we're doing here. And then I was giving a presentation called This is What We're Facing and This is What We Can Do About It, which focused obviously on what we were talking about earlier, the Great Reset, these kind of bigger agendas, but more importantly, okay, what are we going to do about it? And I think 
the talk will probably be a little different in Mexico because obviously Mexico's got a different situation at the moment. In the U.S., it was very much saying, hey, guys, you need to wake up. You need to pay attention to what's happening right now. You need to figure out what your moves are. Are you going to get out of the city? Are you going to go to Mexico? What's your, you know, what's your situation? And in Mexico, I feel like it'd be more of a, especially when hopefully speaking to um, actual Mexican citizens, because we definitely are going to make an effort to make this a bilingual tour. And, you know, I've just been making more of an effort to get my documentaries and my books in Spanish and really connect with the the Mexican activists that I see popping up. I've seen these Mexicans for truth, uh, truth groups popping up around the country. And I feel like the message to the Mexicans is more specifically at this moment, don't let this happen. Stop it now before it gets worse. Like that's kind of the message. Whereas like in the US, it's sort of that message, but it's like, hey guys, we've got this right on our, you know, our asses right here but let's not let it get to Australia, right? And Mexico, it's like, hey, let's not even let it get anywhere near the US or any of these other places by finding ways to be free of these systems and, you know, pushing back when and where we can. And I think it's definitely important for people like us, like as expats to to try to get the the Mexican community activated, you know, and just, you know, I've, I've really learned in the last year how most of the folks who get into this type of content let's say anarchism or travel or crypto or these kind of intersecting things, freedom in general, right? They're watching English speaking content creators from America, from Canada, from Australia. And sometimes that stuff gets translated into other languages, but for the most part, it doesn't. So there's Mexican activists who probably feel like we do, but they don't have this huge ecosystem, you know, of different channels and subgenres and debates and arguments, you know, there's maybe a few content creators. And so to me, I'm like, okay, I want to get as much of those really powerful documentaries that woke up many of us or the books that woke us up and get them translated to Spanish if they're not already. And just, we're calling this effort, translate the truth. I'm going to be working with James Corbett on it, on trying to get some of his work and some other people's works translated so that we can really like, just imagine if all these things that empowered so many of us and got us questioning things are now in Spanish for the first time that can go across Mexico, Central and South America, you know, just all over the U.S. to Spanish speaking community. I think it's going to take stuff like that to really build a movement. So the activation tour in Mexico is kind of part of that effort of us saying like, hey, let's bring this message to Mexico and connect with the Mexicans out there who are paying attention and the ones who maybe are open to paying attention if they hear about these ideas. Because if they don't come across somebody like us, then they might not ever really even challenge yeah. things you know like you people in mexico do wear a mask like it's it's same thing in morelia you go towards centro sometimes not always but sometimes centro or definitely like a walmart or the big box stores you're going to see yeah. that kind of thing and personally i don't really judge a place on how free it is based on what other people are doing but none of us really like to see that and what i encourage people to do because i'll see people saying oh i came to this town or this place and people were wearing masks i'm leaving And it's like, well, did you try to speak to them about why you don't wear masks? Did you try to hand them a flyer or just have a conversation with them? Because I feel like Mexicans, in my experience, like we've gone out and passed out flyers in San Miguel, Morelia and Chiapas and a few other places and had no negative experiences. They've been very, very receptive to taking information and saying, thank you. Thank you. You know, kind of the opposite experience of the U.S. And I feel like at this point, it's really just a lack of information. They don't really have the same resources that are in English. So I'm kind of taking it upon myself and I challenge anybody else who wants to help build freedom out here in Mexico, like to make an effort to reach Mexicans, you know, don't just say, Oh, these people are wearing masks or they're, you know, they're not awake or whatever. They need the information. And so that's what the, the activation tour is going to be about for Mexico too. Okay. Well, that's great. You know, I I don't know if you remember, we, we spoke about that when you're here that I was saying that I've been talking about, yeah, I've been talking about that with people too, because yeah, that's, you know, it would be really easy to just translate good stuff. You know, the stuff that I see that you've got some of your articles in Spanish and stuff, and that's great. Translate documentaries wouldn't be a hard thing. It would probably not be a big moneymaker, you know, as it gets going, you know, but if somebody could uh, get that going, it might probably take a couple of years. And I think it could be really big because it's it's a giant gap in the market. Um, And one thing I think that might be challenging though, is at this point, getting something like that off the ground when, you know, censorship is just, you know, all over the place, it might be kind of hard. You know what I mean? Like a lot of people that are, that are really known in the alternative news space, they, you know, got a foothold 10, 20 years ago. If you're just trying to start out now in another language, I don't know, you're just going to get banned on Facebook. Oh, absolutely. 
platform. So, well, anyway, thankfully they still have DVD players around Mexico, right? I mean, right. one of the biggest things we used to do is go out and just hand people DVDs and it'd have, yeah. you know, five, 10 documentaries on it and like, hey, go down the rabbit hole. So maybe once we get some of these things translated, we could try something like that. But yeah, I mean, I think, I think it'll be important in the coming years. That's funny. I think you're the exact same age as me and you did um, the same thing. I, I, I think I heard you say that it was like Ron Paul and um, watching like some Alex Jones documentaries and stuff like that <laughs> yeah, during yeah. the, uh, during the financial crash. And yeah. uh and I did the same thing. I used to uh, have DVDs and I would go and hand it out in front of the federal reserve, probably the same yep. time you were doing yeah. in Charlotte, North Carolina. I used to do that. And nice. It's pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, like, yeah, uh, we need to bring that, that activism back. I think that some people are too dependent now on social media. And like, as you were saying, now we're seeing like, Hey, we can't really depend on social media. We're being censored. We're being blocked out or whatever. So yep. it feels like some of that old school stuff, like a flyer in the hand or a DVD in the hand is, is still powerful. I still have the DVDs downstairs, you know, like freedom to fascism, yeah. uh, end game, uh, money is debt, all this yep. type of stuff. And, you know, I think another thing is, you know, like physical books, physical DVDs, it's good to mm-hmm. archive them and keep them because we don't know, you know, in the future, they could just, you know, d- make everything disappear, make the uh, documentaries exactly. disappear. You can't find it. So if we have those, then we can put, and also uploading them onto things like Odyssey that hopefully, yep. you know, will stay up. So um, I want to ask you, uh, one of the biggest problems, stumbling blocks that I talk a lot about on on the podcast is money. You know, people say, yeah, this all sounds great, but I got to, you know, how am I, I can't quit my job. So having some sort of autonomous income is very important. Um, you know, different types of agorist businesses, you know, people think like, yeah, I can get with the freedom cell. Now, what do I like? How, what? Um, what are some examples of some, you know, for different people that, you know, to get started getting location independent income or getting autonomous income or some agorist businesses that you've seen within the freedom cell that have worked for people? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, I think that, like you said earlier, with people being hesitant to move and kind of getting overwhelmed by that, obviously, we all got to survive somehow and having an income is a part of that at the moment. So it, it can be overwhelming for people to think about what's the next stage. I do think that, like, let's say you got your full-time job right now. Start start cultivating those, those interests and those hobbies and those goals you have. So maybe you have a hobby that's sort of a thing you do on the side. But if you're able to turn that more into an entrepreneurship and actually start making a little bit of income of it, on it, or if you already have something like that that you do on the side maybe somebody works a day job but then they go sell some of their stuff at the farmers markets on the weekends or something right i feel like there's opportunity to to cultivate uh those things and essentially make that your focus now like you said that kind of i think the the goal is whether people want to be location independent or just be you know independent of a boss necessarily right like you know I'm, i work from home doing articles and doing my work and be, can be paid anywhere but I, i'm still stationary i have the freedom though to work on my own schedule these are the kind of things i think people are really after or people are looking for and people are looking for something that's going to allow them to just be more self-sufficient in general right like i've met some people who say like i don't necessarily want another job i want to put the money i've made into land and get a community and try to live, you know, within my means and start growing as much of my food as I can. So I don't have to work all the time, you know, or whatever, or just maybe I have some residual income. So I see kind of some of those different approaches where people are either trying to rid themselves of the need for a day job, or yes, trying to have like a location independent income. And one of the like basic things specifically, if you're trying to move to Mexico, I mean, people always hear like, English teaching English is like one of the things I've seen people start with, and then go elsewhere to other things. Um, cause I mean, unfortunately people who, there are people who reach out that I don't always have a perfect answer for them. Cause they're like, Hey, I'm a, uh, I'm a, you know, engineer at this company and I build buildings. Like, do you think I can find a job in Mexico? It's like, I have no idea. That's not, you know, I know it's not easy for anybody just to pick up a job and maybe even, and you might have something to say about this. Uh, I've heard it's sort of like looked down upon really, if you're taking jobs for Mexicans, like for people who are just trying to come take a day laborer job or something like that. Like that and and also obviously the pay might not be what people are used to from the u.s and from other countries to me it really is a key, like if you can have some product or service to offer that can be sold through the internet using the internet you know while it's still available to us uh that to me seems like a, 
a better alternative, especially for those coming to Mexico. If you're not talking about coming to Mexico, you're just staying wherever you're at, but you're still trying to look for independent income. Then I would focus on what I was saying earlier. Like what are the, the skills you have that you're not taking advantage of and really maximizing and, and making a source of income for yourself? Or what are the hobbies and the extracurricular things you're doing that could potentially turn into more full-time gigs that would give you more freedom? Maybe you wouldn't be making as much money in the beginning, perhaps as you transition, but you'll have more freedom. And to what I've found, and I think you might agree, James, that like having more time and freedom of time, that gives you the opportunity to learn more skills to become more valuable and more necessary and more useful to other people to kind of develop your entrepreneurial toolkit and then go out there and make more money. Right. So I kind of see it like maybe you start transitioning away from that 60, 70 hour a day job. You start working less hours while you're working on the other project. And then the goal being obviously one of them, you know, the project eclipses the day job. And then you don't have to do that anymore. Maybe you realize, actually, I don't need to work 70 hours a week anymore if I don't want to, you know, maybe you like to, so you feel like you're doing that, but the goal to me is, is always like, if I can maximize my free time, then I have more opportunity to make money as well by creating sources of income that aren't going to be dependent on being on someone else's schedule necessarily, or, uh, you know, having to go deal with the boss. Like I definitely have been out of that game for 12 years and I don't think I could work with anybody lording over me in any way at this point, yeah. you know? Yep. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And, you know, uh, one thing I would say is that a lot of people, they don't realize, I mean, they know that it's inexpensive to live in Mexico, but they don't realize how cheap. I mean, especially if you have a property in the U.S. or something, or you have some kind of money where you can buy a property down here. If you can buy a house or buy land that you can live on, I mean, you can live on very, very little money. Like if you don't have to pay rent, even if you do have to pay rent, rent isn't crazy. But I mean, if, if you got some sort of savings, you can make it for a while. You know what I mean? Uh, While well, you figure things out. Yeah. And I don't, but anyways, um, yeah. So uh, I would say that trying to come down here and get a job is not going to be a good idea. Cause you, I mean, you're going to be amazed. The cost of living is low, but so are the wages. Um, so that's probably not good, but if you have some sort of skill like, you know, mechanic or electrician or gardener or something like that, you can uh, just come down here and, and start doing that work for people. And because you, you know, you're going to want to learn Spanish, uh, you don't have to learn Spanish, but if you can just start with the other expats, if you know English, um, you can actually charge pretty good and you can, you can do okay. You know, just working for other expats in the area until you get started and, and build up a little business there for whatever skill that you might have it might take you a little bit of time to get, but um, to know, but know people and enough, you know, have the network, but um, you can do all right. Just doing something like that. And uh, you know, other types of little like under the table or agorist businesses can work. You know, I have a friend that sells uh mezcal from he gets it straight from oaxaca and he sells it here and that does well and yeah, different things like that so nice anyways yeah 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 that's always a big thing you know that's the biggest thing that people just had, they don't know how they're gonna survive you know and, and i can understand yeah. that so and you know, i think you made All a right. good point though about the the expat community being like a good source of um potential right because that is definitely it seems like in the beginning people come to town, they're networking with the other expats before they get integrated themselves or build their own resources. And yeah, a lot of times those are going to be the people that you might be trading crypto with or buying or selling from, or you're trying to sell your products or, you know, I have a, you remind me, I have a friend who came down with us and she's a massage therapist. And that's what she's basically done is kind of travel to the different freedom cells communities or the, just the different freedom communities, expat communities around the country and looking for where it feels like home for her, but using her massage skills as a way to make income while she's getting around. Yeah. All right. So um, you are doing, uh, we're recording this on the 12th, but I believe it's on the 20th. You're doing a webinar called Mexit. So maybe you want to let people know about that. Yeah. Thanks again, brother. Uh, mm -hmm. It's at the conscious resistance.com slash Mexit, M E X I T. And it's pretty much, you know, it's going to be a bit about what we talked today. I'm going to be doing this with Miriam. So we'll, we'll both be giving our perspective of what we've experienced over the last year and a half. Um, it will be focused a little bit on Michoacan, like just what we, the resources we have here, but we're also going to be talking about some of what you're doing. And, uh, we're just over the next week, we're just kind of meeting with different, uh, uh, different folks in Mexico who have resources. These are people who've reached out to me over the last year who we've worked with as we're looking for land for our community. 
from real estate agents to real estate attorneys who are willing to review documents to others who just help people move. You know, if you're just trying to look for, you got questions about moving. Um, and then of course the resources we have in Morelia, as well as other folks who are reaching out to me and saying, Hey, I have land available in this part of the country. I'm looking for other people. So we're going to be trying to go through some of the benefits, some of the drawbacks, some of what we covered today, we'll go a little more in depth and then, yeah, we'll make sure that we're going to be providing um, like a PDF document, as well as going over during the webinar for everybody who's interested. Like, here's the resources you might need, you know, follow up with James, follow up with this woman, follow up with this guy. Uh, so that people who are seriously considering it, and we're hearing from people for right now from, like you said, a lot of Can Canadians just came and just got the heck out. Some are still trying to get out over the next couple of weeks. Um, so Canada, Ireland, the UK, of course, the US and elsewhere. I mean, there's a lot of people from different parts of the world, really right. Australia, of course, still trying to get out, trying to figure out if Mexico is the place for them. So it's going to be a free online webinar, like you said, November 20th at 1 p.m. Central. And then we're going to make it, it'll be available after that. You, we'll put it on the, the website and the links and all that good stuff. And if anybody wants to make sure they get updates, when you hear this, just go to the, the conscious resistance.com slash exit, and you can sign up for the email and I'll be sending out some updates in the coming week. And yeah, I mean, it's just part of our effort. We're, we're just trying to get more and more people out here. I think it's to all of our benefit, James, that we have more freedom minded people coming this way and especially action oriented people who are really trying to think of these kinds of conversations. So yeah, if this sounds good to you guys, check it out and we'll be, we'll be sharing that with you and hopefully bring in some more freedom minded people out here. Awesome. And uh, so I don't know if there's anything else that you want to let people know about any other projects or just go to your, your uh, blog to keep up on what you're doing. Um, now, the only thing I would mention again, I briefly mentioned earlier, but we're doing the greater reset in Morelia in, in Mexico again uh, in January 26th to the 30th. So for those who hadn't, haven't heard of it, thegreaterreset.org is the website. And this is basically just us as free people responding to the World Economic Forum and saying, hey, you know what, we're not going to be swept up in your technocratic vision. We're going to create our own vision of what a free world looks like. And so five days, five different themes, the counter economy, talking about things like crypto and alternative currencies, talking about food, permaculture, growing food health in different ways. And we've got lots of really good speakers, some who are going to be online only like James Corbett, because he's in Japan, and then others who are going to be in person in Mexico. And so we're having like a hybrid event. So if you're in Texas, you can go to the event in Central Texas, where my buddy John Bush will be hosting and we'll have some speakers there, some speakers here in Morelia, and some online and five days of, uh, of just connecting with people, there'll be people coming from all over the world and from Mexico to be involved and we're going to try to have as much stuff going on in the city as possible for people who want to go check out the tourist stuff and the cathedrals. They can do that. But we're also going to try to have, you know, hikes up to the, the hills and the mountains around the city, maybe like a day trip to Chiran or to Pazcuaro and some of the you know local areas and just show people what this area has to offer, as well as get them informed with a lot of solutions. And I think that is going to hopefully bring a lot of the folks who are interested in what you're doing and what I'm doing it's going to give them opportunity to say, you know what, come to the event and visit Mexico. This gives you an excuse to come here, come to the event, meet a lot of like-minded people throughout the, you know, five or six days and then spend some time. And that's what we saw this past year. We did the event in January and in May in Zihuatanejo and it sparked a lot of people coming from Europe and elsewhere who are still here in the country now. And they're trying to figure out where they want to, you know, establish their foundation. So that's going to be the project and that'll pretty much just kick off the activation tour across Mexico. But uh, yeah, if anybody's interested, check out the greater reset.org. We'll be announcing all the speakers and everything else. Okay, great, great. You're doing a lot of good work. Um, thanks for coming on the podcast, taking the time. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, brother. Yeah. And so we'll stay in touch. Thanks for joining us for the borderless podcast, traveling, investing, and living beyond borders.